Welcome to LTV's Israel Daily. I'm Amit Harari, and coming up in today's newscast, Netanyahu addressing major issues at the Jewish Republican Conference in Vegas. The 2022 World Cup starting today in Qatar to the light of millions, but isn't going without criticism. And an incredible project bringing attention to IDF veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress. Trouble brewing in Judea and Samaria as Israeli celebrations take a turn for the worse and the PS control over the cities and mandate deteriorates. ILTV's Aaron Poor is with the details. Weekend celebrations turning violent when a female IDF soldier injured by Jewish Israelis in Hebron. This as crowds of religious youths marched through the Jewish and Palestinian sides of the city with Israeli flags to mark the annual Chaye Sarah Torah reading. The portion describes how Abraham purchased the cave of the patriarchs and the adjoining grounds as a burial plot for his wife, Sarah. And annually, hundreds flocked to the streets in the area for celebratory events. But this year, violent altercations erupting Saturday between Jewish marchers and Palestinians as the Palestinians began to throw stones and the Jews responding in kind. IDF soldiers, meantime, working to maintain calm and separate the crowds when a group of Jewish marchers attacked a female soldier with a stick. Several worshippers arrested for rioting and violence against soldiers in what IDF Chief Kochavi and Defense Minister Gantz are calling an extreme and unacceptable attack. In other news, the Israeli Shin Bet and several other groups, including visiting U.S. officials, increasingly concerned that the Palestinian Authority is in danger of imminent collapse. The security organization explaining that the threat of escalation on the backdrop of Israel's new government is very real, especially given the PA's loss of control in Judea and Samaria, coupled with unaffiliated Palestinian youths who have easy access to both weapons and targets, but do not remember the Second Intifada or its fallout. In the interest of security across the region, then senior Biden administration officials urging Israel and the PA to advance steps to strengthen the Palestinian Authority and to improve Palestinian livelihoods as well as the PA's economy. Prime Minister-designate Benjamin Netanyahu says that despite the policy differences, he expects to work closely with the Biden administration as well as with both houses of Congress. Speaking via video conference to the Republican Jewish Coalition meeting in Las Vegas, Netanyahu did not hide that the Iran nuclear deal is a point of contention. ILTV's Steve Leibovitz reports. Benjamin Netanyahu received a warm welcome appearing by video conference before the Jewish Republican Coalition meeting in Las Vegas. Netanyahu's appearance followed that of several potential Republican presidential candidates, including former President Donald Trump and apparent frontrunner, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Netanyahu focused on the dangers posed by the Iran nuclear deal, which the Obama administration proposed, the Trump administration canceled, and the Biden administration is now advancing. I'll do everything in my power to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them to us and, by the way, to you too. Uh, and if that meant taking a stand uh, against uh, uh, a sitting administration, then so be it. And I did it, but not, not haphazardly and not, uh, not lightheartedly. It was a difficult decision. I described it in, in my book. Netanyahu has had a long and sometimes contentious relationship with U.S. President Joe Biden, but he believes that they can work well together as strategic allies. And people in Washington and in America and in the West are beginning to realize Israel's great value. Uh, it's, uh, it's being a great asset to Western security against the multitude of uh, uh, Islamic radicals uh, and especially against this regime called Iran that chants death to Israel, death to America. Possible 2024 presidential candidate Ron DeSantis made clear his strong support for Israel. But I will say, if you look at our record on issues related to Israel and supporting the Jewish community, it is second to none. We, when I first became governor, one of the first things we did was fight back against Airbnb, who was discriminating against Israeli Jews, and we won that fight against Airbnb. DeSantis and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley seem to be the clear crowd favorites among the assembled Jewish Republicans. Now with me to discuss the effect of this conference is Chairman of the Republicans Overseas Israel, Mark Zell. Hi, Mark. 
Hi, Amit. So, Mark, Netanyahu is taking stage at a Republican conference. How do you see this influencing the working relations with the Democratic Party at the White House now that Netanyahu is getting back to prime ministry? Well, I think Bibi and Netanyahu is a diplomatic wizard. And uh, he, show, he demonstrated his, uh, his wizardry uh, during his address to the RJC. He could have been very partisan. It's a, it's a partisan organization. He didn't. He didn't do that. He, he emphasized his strong 40-year-old personal relationship with President Biden. And based on that, he went on to say that he believes that he can have a working relationship with the American government, even though uh, they disagree on many policy issues, chief of which is the renewal of the Iran nuclear deal. Yes, and on that, Netanyahu also, he didn't really spare compliments to Donald Trump. How does Biden see this? I mean, although we also spoke about him there. Well, look, I, I didn't hear BB uh, weigh in heavily on Donald Trump other than to talk about the uh, the achievements that, that were made during the Trump administration. Now, Bibi, uh, when he was talking about the Abraham Accords, for example, uh, put a great deal of emphasis on his work that preceded the Trump administration. But I think we all uh, can agree that were it not for uh, President Trump and his close coordination with uh, Bibi Netanyahu when he was prime minister, the Abraham Accords, which were a premier achievement of both the Israeli and American administrations at the time, would not have occurred. And, and, um, and Donald Trump, in his, his discussion, also emphasized this and uh, was, was particularly upbeat about the prospects, should he win, of uh, achieving what Donald Trump described as a whole new uh, uh, array of uh, agreements with countries like Saudi Arabia. He even said that he could uh, foresee wall-to-wall -wall agreements between Israel and its Arab neighbors across the Middle, Middle East, with the Palestinians perhaps coming in last. Yes, and now Netanyahu, he also spoke about Iran. Does Netanyahu's opposition to the Iran nuclear deal have strong backing in the Republican Party? Most assuredly, uh, uh, you can you can take it to the bank that the Republican Party is squarely behind uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and many of the ideas that are and the policies that are uh, likely to be adopted by the incoming Israeli government. That is not true with the uh, Democratic uh, Party, and I think Donald Trump and his remarks emphasize this as well. Bibi was careful not to. Uh, not to create a polarization between Israel and the United States. After all, he is going to have to work with the Biden administration for the next couple of years. But uh, I think it's uh, he, he, both Bibi and his uh, uh, coalition partners in Israel will be uh, recalled upon to set very clear boundaries with respect to Israel's relations with the United States, both with respect to Iran the participation of uh, Smotrich and Ben Gavir in the uh, uh, upcoming coalition government and a uh, uh, possibility of annexing parts of Judea and Samaria. Yes, and Mark, among the leading potential Republican candidates for president, we have Trump, we have DeSantis, former Vi uh, Vice President Pence, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. Are they all equally pro-Israel? Can we say that? Well, anyway, equally, but they are of as, a, as the party is, strongly pro-Israel, and particularly in contrast to the Democratic Party. But what I do want to say, Amit, is that we you could see this at the RJC event. You saw a number of potential pre presidential candidates, including one actual presidential candidate, uh, coming, uh, coming before this uh, a very, very uh, um, important organization within our party. And these candidates are first class. Almost every one of them uh, was very impressive, received a very warm welcome uh, from the uh, people, the participants in the conference. And uh, we can look forward to more. Many of them, uh, there, there are even more who, uh, candidates who did not appear at the RJC who are considered very likely uh, to run in, uh, for the 2024 election. It's a, great, it's a great deep bench in the Republican Party 
that's a strong, stark contrast to what's going on in the Democratic side. Thank you very much, Mark, for all your insights. Thank you for joining us. Great to be there. Bye-bye. Now, returning to Jerusalem, would-be Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu still fighting with the High Court as well as coalition partners in attempts to negotiate a cabinet? ILTV's Aaron Poor is reporting. Some 71% of Israelis reportedly think that Shas leader Arya Deri is not fit to serve as finance minister in light of his previous criminal convictions and suspended jail sentence. And likewise, at least 56% of Israel thinks that neither Deri nor religious Zionism head Bezalel Smotrich could serve as defense minister, especially as neither Deri nor his electorate serve in the army and Smotrich never finished his service. In contrast to Smotrich, however, Derry is demanding the finance ministry. But to get it, Netanyahu needs approval from the elections committee, which he's not expected to get, given Derry's suspended sentence. Likewise, the high court would not really allow it. Therefore, to overrule the powers that be, Netanyahu and his coalition partners are looking to temporarily install Likud MK Yeriv Levin as Knesset speaker in order to present and pass the Knesset override bill. Once passed, if Derry is rejected from a ministerial portfolio, the coalition to be could overrule the rejection. And here things get particularly hairy. Despite all of the right-wing factions agreeing on the Knesset override clause, Smotrich is holding fast to his demand to serve as Minister of Defense and is therefore actively blocking Levine's temporary appointment until it's promised to him. Further, this is on top of several Likud members now raising their opposition to Netanyahu's planned appointments. MK David Bitan, for example, saying that Netanyahu's willingness to give up senior ministries such as finance and defense is the worst possible negotiation method. Further, Bitan is blasting Bibi for considering former ambassador to the United States Ron Dermer for the foreign ministry, as Dermer was not part of the Likud party during the elections. Still, with the deadline to finish talks weeks away, it's far too early to talk of failure, and Smotrich's leverage is soon to expire with his party splitting, as planned, from Itamar Benvir's Otsma Yehudit, now that the elections are over. Extreme with views exposed on its reporting revealing seriously troubling views held by a longtime CNN staffer. Joining us with more editor at Honest Reporting, Akiva Van Koningsveld. Hi, Akiva. Good afternoon. Akiva, tell us a little more about Idris Mukhtar. Firstly, like, who is the guy and what was the process of exposing him? Yes, Mr. Ibrahim has worked for CNN since 2015, uh, where he reported from Africa, for example, on President Obama's visit to Africa. And since then, he has worked for CNN up until last Friday. And uh, as part of our investigative work as a media watchdog, we uh, discovered several very troubling tweets, including one where he declared himself part of hashtag Team Hitler. And he said Hamas has a right to their quote unquote resistance against Israeli civilians and terrorist attacks. Um, and he was credited last Sunday, uh, November 13, on an article about Israel's incoming coalition. And that led us to uh, discover him. And as our as part of our work as a media watchdog, we exposed his tweets, which led to his firing uh, finally on Friday. That's indeed very disturbing. But I'll have to ask, I mean, what does this say about CNN and their hiring process? I mean, do they not know, not check, or simply don't they care about his outspoken public views? We have to say they're outspoken. Everyone sees them. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, notably, his his. Uh, Team Hitler tweet was only posted several months before he was hired, first hired by CNN. Um, but but uh, Mr. Ibrahim is only the latest anti-Semitic journalist we exposed. Over the last few months alone, we uncovered five anti-Semitic journalists and also uh, pro-terror journalists working for mainstream outlets. And we successfully convinced, uh, for example, the New York Times to cut ties with several supporters of Adolf Hitler. What about him now? Is he still working at CNN? Um, he was, CNN cut all ties with him uh, last Friday after uh, our supporters en masse emailed CNN's, CNN's email addresses and uh, forced them to cut ties with him. Um, but as I said, I think this is part of a larger problem where um, news outlets do not do their, their due diligence. Uh, it took us around 10 minutes to find these tweets. Why did CNN not find these tweets? Uh, you're totally right. And Akiva, you're, you said something about it. Do you think we're addressing extremism and anti-Semitism the right way? I mean, the world, the media outlets are focusing on 
as you said, mainly like punishing, firing, and so on, instead of really addressing their problematic views and trying to educate them and change their minds, looking at people like Kanye West and Idris Mukhtar himself? Well, yeah, um, trust in journalism is at an all-time low, and um, when, it, when we discover these journalists who hold clear anti-Israel and anti-Semitic views, uh, that comes to no surprise. And it is, it is imperative that the media restore trust in journalism by uh, taking measures against journalists that are clearly not objective. If they, if they would have um, made any other racist remark about any other group, there would, be full, there would be full disclosure about their conflict of interest. But here it's almost uh, seems to be normalized that these, these journalists are anti-Semitic and working for some of the world's world most reputable outlets. So what can be done in your opinion? I mean, what's the media's actually job? What's the media's goal here? The media should uh, obviously vet all their hires properly, which takes only a, a mere amount of minutes. And at the same time, they uh, anti-Semitism is at a dangerously high level in the U.S. at this point, with the FBI warning uh, just last week that uh, um, the amount of hate crimes against Jews is rising to a level of national priority. Um, and the media should shine a light on these hate crimes instead of abetting them. Kiva, what are you working on these days? You, honest reporting. Well, as part of our work as a media watchdog, we uh, shine a light on anti-Israel and anti-Semitic anti media bias, uh, especially when this is ideologically motivated. Um, and we will continue our work. Just uh, a few weeks ago, when we, uh, when we exposed two anti-Semitic journalists working for the New York Times, we were attacked by Iran's press TV uh, with several threats that were made to our staff members. And we are undeterred and we will keep, we will keep fighting anti-Israel media bias. Very interesting, Akiva. Very impressive work. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. The FIFA World Cup in Qatar is finally getting underway today and for the next 28 days fans will be able to enjoy football, music and culture in Qatar. But 12 years of questions, criticism and conjecture cannot be ignored. Here are the details. The 2022 World Cup kicks off today with a match between Qatar and Ecuador that will kick off the world's biggest football competition and one of the few events that can make the whole world sit down in front of the TV. Qatar, which has a population of less than 3 million, expects to see a total influx of about 1.2 million visitors from around the world over the coming month. History was made this morning at the Ben Gurion Airport with the first direct flight that took off at 9 a.m. from Israel to Qatar, operated by the Cypriot Tus Airways with the fans all very excited. On another note, 12 years have passed since FIFA decided to grant Russia and Qatar the hosting of the 2018 and the 2022 World Cup respectively. 12 years full of question marks, shocking revelations, criminal investigations and many doubts. The Qatar World Cup is the first to be held in a Muslim country with strict controls over alcohol, presenting challenges for the organizers of an event often associated with beer drinking fans. Homosexuality is illegal in a conservative Muslim country, and some soccer players have raised concerns for fans traveling to the event, especially lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals and women, who ride groups say Qatari laws discriminate against. But World Cup organizers have repeatedly said that everyone, no matter their sexual orientation or background, is welcome during the tournament. FIFA president Gianni Infantino commented on the criticism just a day before the tournament begins. Today, I have uh, very strong feelings, I can tell you that. Today, I feel uh, Qatari. Today, I feel Arab. Today, I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. Colombian singer Maluma stormed out of an Israeli interview in Qatar called Israeli Khan correspondent Moavadi rude after being asked about the country's human rights record. Yeah, but it's something that I can't resolve. I just came here to enjoy life, enjoy soccer. The party of soccer is not, is not actually something that I have to be involved with. 
I'm here enjoying my music and the uh, beautiful life playing soccer too. Meanwhile, FIFA asked the world to focus on football and what is certain, we're expected to see a lot of color and joy from all over the world combined with quite a bit of global criticism, all in the coming 28 days. The most wanted Israeli crime boss was arrested in South Africa and is being held for possible extradition. Ben Simot was wanted by Interpol on suspicion of murder, attempted murder, and a range of other crimes. The details in the following report. Ben Simon had been on Interpol's worldwide red notice list in 2015. Nicknamed the most wanted Israeli in the world, the 46-year-old underworld leader was grabbed by South African authorities with assistance from Interpol and Israeli intelligence. Ben Simon was arrested together with seven associates. The 46-year-old Israeli gang leader who was arrested uh, during a takedown operation in Princeton will appear before the Rhinebeck Magistrates Court this morning to face charges for crimes he committed in Israel. He, together with seven others, will be back before the Rhinebeck Magistrates Court on Monday to face charges of crimes committed in South Africa. Ben Simon is a leader of a notorious gang dealing in international drug trafficking, extortion and other criminal activities. He's also suspected of placing bombs on their two cars in 2003 and 2004. During the raid, police confiscated 12 firearms, including five assault rifles, seven pistols and $40,000 in cash. Ben Simon is known for his connections to the infamous Abergil Israeli organized crime family and its imprisoned leader, Itzhak Abergil. A first-of-its-kind art exhibition opening in New York City on behalf of Israeli IDF veterans with PTSD. In the exhibition that opened at the end of the week, about 50 photos of Israeli leaders and opinion leaders who were photographed next to the IDF veterans with post-traumatic stress are displayed, decorating the walls of the gallery in Seoul, Manhattan. Meantime, designated Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whose pictures appears in the exhibition's central wall, sending in a video greeting the audience on the morning of the event, while Israeli singer Raviv Kaner performed his debut song, Resisim, or Sharpnels, which was written about his experiences as a fighter. In defense news, a ship-mounted version of the Iron Dome air defense system is now fully operational. The Navy is saying that the S-80 Style 6 class Corvette is now fitted with the advanced mode Sea Dome to protect form airborne threats at sea. At 80 meters long with top seat of 28 knots and a range of 3,500 nautical miles, the vessel can be also used to deploy special forces units and it's armed with electronic warfare systems. The Star 6 being tasked with protecting the natural gas platforms developed off the Israeli coast as well as keeping ship lanes safe. The S-80 is the Israeli Navy's flagship vessel for the next decade. It's designed for stealth, agility, and cutting-edge capabilities in a variety of potential battle scenarios. In recent years, the Israeli Navy has begun to upgrade its entire combat fleet that includes a new Dolphin-class submarines. In the video, the Iron Dome is seen intercepting a missile launch from another ship. In other tests, the air defense system successfully defended against drones and cruise missiles. The test simulated real threats and included the system's successful detection and interception of targets in challenging scenarios. An impressive sports accomplishment for Israeli Taekwondo fighter Dana Azran, the 21-year-old athlete earning a silver medal at the World Championships underway in Guadalajara, Mexico. Now, Azran notched Israel's second medal ever in the championships and the first since 2005 competing in the 73-plus kilogram category. Azran won second place after losing the final to gold medalist Vetlana Osipova from Uzbekistan. During the preliminary stages, Azran scored impressive wins over opponents from the Ivory Coast and France. She advanced through the quarterfinals by beating local favorite Paloma Garcia from Mexico and then overcame Germany's Lorena Brandel to reach the finals. Last year, Abishak Semberg won a Taekwondo bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympics, and Semberg then competed in the under-9 49-kilogram competition, but lost in a quarterfinals to a Mexican competitor. Very impressive. Now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight, you can expect clear skies and a slight rise in temperatures from an average low of about 15 degrees Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, cloudy skies overhead and the average high expected to be about 27 Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our LTV channels on YouTube, Facebook and Telegram. And subscribe to our LTV newsletter. I'm Amita Rari. Thank you so much for watching.